I want to say to all of you, hello and welcome to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm so thrilled that we're doing this live. Uh, so thankful to Community of Christ uh, and to Lindsay Sunstone, the Open Stories Foundation, uh, and mostly to all of you who have come on a Thursday night and are willing to spend some time with us. And I get to say thank you too, John, before you keep going on. Thank you for the beautiful music. Thank you to Lindsay. I love you, Lindsay. John, thank you for inviting me. I love you, John. Don't you ever forget it. <laughs> and I love your good wife, Margie, sitting right there. And I love my friend, Kim Turner, and, and Tamara Wright for taking care of all my ineptitudes <laughs> so I can do what I do. Yeah. So th and we thank the community of Christ for being so Christ-like as to welcome us here. Thank you. Let's give everyone a round of applause. <laughs> So uh, those of you who follow Mormon Stories podcast will know that uh, this is not the first time we've had the dear Carolyn Pearson on uh, our program. We definitely did one of those epic four or five hour interviews with Carolyn, and we're not going to be retreading a lot of that ground uh, from that interview, but we are going to refer all our newer listeners to that episode, and we'll say that it's definitely one of the most important episodes we've ever done. So if you haven't checked that out. Pause this, go listen to it, then come back and finish listening to this interview. Um, Carolyn has been important uh, to so many of us for so long. Uh, I don't know if it's doing her adequate justice to call her the Maya, An Maya Angelou of Mormonism. Do you like that? Is that okay? Oh, that would be way okay. Would that it would be true? No. Thank you for the thought. No, I, I you know, we named our, uh, our second child after Maya Angelou, so we have deep respect for her work. But when I read uh, her writings, I feel like she's every bit worthy of that title and more. Um, her, her books are so wonderfully written. I don't know that I've ever read, read a more uh, inspiring and thoughtful and wise author as Carol Lynn. So I'm glad Lindsay was able to plug those books. Today we're here to plug an amazing book. And not to plug, but to explore and to encourage not only everyone to purchase this book, but to read it and to share it. Um, I think it'd be kind of cool to read Greg Prince's introduction or, or sort of description of this book, because from Greg Prince, this is actually saying a lot. Uh, Greg Prince wrote, rarely in the history of Mormonism has a literary work become a proximate cause of a shift in the way the institutional church sees itself, interprets its past, or charts its future. With Juanita Brooks's Mount Meadows Massacre and Lester Bush's Mormonism's Negro Doctrine, and historical overview being on the very short list. Now, Greg is not necessarily known to be effusive in his praise, but he writes, the ghost of eternal polygamy has the potential of joining that list, blending her personal passion and insights with the voices of the respondents to her massive survey. Carolyn Pearson has hit a home run in her quest to illuminate both the damage that Mormonism's de facto practice of polygamy continues to inflict and the route to a better, more humane place. Those who truly hope for eternal polygamy or who resent any call to institutional reform will be upset, but countless others will rejoice that she has shown a more excellent way. Um, I, uh, I have to admit that I, I stopped reading Mormon books a long time ago um, just because I kind of have gotten bored and, uh, and maybe it's a little bit of avoidance, but uh, I've had this book for a while uh, and I haven't read it, but over the past two days, I read it. And I'm just telling you, this is an amazing book. It's important and it's super powerful. And I just can't, I can't say enough about the importance of this book. How many of you have read it? Raise your hand. All right, good for you, about half of you. The others of you have some work to do. Um, so let's dig right in. So Carolyn, uh, you have a long uh, history, uh, 40 books, is that right? 40 plus books? You count plays and small books and humor, yeah. So poetry, plays, books, um, but what you know, what you've often been known for, uh, Carolyn is the author. Uh, she she wrote My Turn on Earth, the uh, the lyrics for My Turn on Earth, right? And the uh, story. And the story, the the wonderful hymn. If you don't walk as most people do, some people walk away from you. That's hers as well. Uh, I won't, I, I won't. won't. Yep, that's mine. 
Um, and, uh, and of course, Lindsay's already mentioned her, her book, uh, Goodbye, I Love You. And Carolyn, in my realm, has been really known as an advocate for the LGBT community for decades and decades. So there was a point a couple years ago where she was like, hey, I'm kind of putting a little bit of the brakes on that effort. And I was like, oh my gosh, how can that be possible? That's kind of, you're gonna ride out into the sunset on your LGBT work. And she had something else in mind. So tell us just a little bit about why you decided to, to do this as, uh, as your next, if not final work, or at least mm -hmm. book. Did you say this is your final book? Oh, no. Okay, good. No, no, no. Okay, good. No so as her next book. <laughs> And I don't recall exactly what I said to you, John, but the, the fact is that I, I was born into this world with women's issues, and then I married into gay issues, and had an opportunity because of that to do some very important work for our LGBT people. But along the line, I, I continued to do my work for, for women, a lot of things, and especially that that uh, DVD that Lindsay held up, Mother Wolf of the Morning, 16 Women Throughout History in Search of God the Mother, very, very important. But I, I felt that there was something further that I wanted to do for women, and it just kept coming at me as, as sort of the, the major issue that needs to be handled before we can move on to other things of how to bring women more centrally into the LDS church. Because this concept of eternal polygamy, I think, gets in the way. And it, it haunted me terribly when I used to believe in polygamy. And as you may have read, those who have read the book, the first major trauma that I had on this subject was in a seminary class at the late great BY High School in Provo, when our seminary teacher bore us his testimony that this is God's way of marriage and that we are not allowed to live it now, but if we are sufficiently worthy, if we, as we become less selfish, you young women, if you become less selfish, you will understand the beauty of all this and yearn to live this principle. And I remember truly where I was in that classroom watching that much loved teacher bear us his testimony and knowing that he would not lie to us, but knowing and walking home knowing that there was a wedge between me and God, between me and God's church, because that was not right. And, and that led to so many years of study and anguish and tears. As a very good, thoughtful BYU student, I would study the books of the brethren, and then I would come home and weep, because I was forever second class. And the, the final thing that proved that was polygamy. So that has always been something that has been very hurtful, very hurtful to me. And gradually, as, as you will read in the book, I, I gave that up, believing that that is, is, never was, and never will be of God. And, and I, I continued to see hurt around me. I continued to hear from women. And, um, and I continued to hear from my loved cousin in Provo, whose husband had passed 10 years before her, asking her, how do you feel about, the, you and I are gonna move over there one of these days, how do you feel? Oh, I feel fine about it, but, but I wonder if my husband has taken a second wife already. And I was just floored and then furious. And I remember leaving her house and saying, somebody needs to do something about that. And obviously, I am the person. Obviously. <laughs> Absolutely. No. no, I am perfectly positioned. To, to write this book, which Absolutely. I did. Absolutely. So this, this book, I mean, really at the core, it's about the, the, the role of women in our theology and in our world. I mean, really. But you chose to sort of address that through the lens of polygamy. And Lindsay and I, 
uh, have had a few talks about the extent to which everything sort of traces back to polygamy, right? And so talk about that, because really I think if this book had a message, it's that women and men need to be partners in, in, in life, in Absolutely. government, in marriage, in, in, uh, in church government, etc. cetera. Why talk, sure. why, why talk about the, the role of women and the importance of women through the lens of polygamy versus just doing a book about women and, and the need for us to respect and love them more. And we love women, don't we, John? <laughs> we do. And I mean, who, who can just write a book about women? I mean, uh, and especially if you're on the trail of trying to find a fuller place for women in this world. We have to look at all that and say, okay, what are the things that need to change? What are the things that we've got to move forward with in order to create a place where partnership can live? And moving out of, part, out of polygamy, out of patriarchy into partnership is the, the larger general theme of this book. And many of us understand and like the word partnership. And you can even hear some of our general authorities use the word partnership as they talk about how, what marriage should be. But marriage can never be a partnership. If polygamy is anywhere on the horizon. And consequently, I mean, there, there are plenty of ways that, that people can choose different aspects of what's holding us back from men and women being true partners, which does not mean doing the same things, thinking in exactly the same way. We need the richness of the diversity of whatever women and men bring to the table, but they have to bring it equally and with, with equal regard for what it is that they bring. And, and to me, in my particular religious organization, the concept of polygamy is one of the, and maybe the first, obvious thing that holds us back from moving into partnership. Because a, a polygamous arrangement is antithetical to partnership. It simply is. And it, it is my belief and my commitment to do whatever I can until I die that, that the LDS church, which I happen to love, the Mormon community, which I regard very, very highly, deserves better than this. And my theme is we are better than this. And that's why I have spent the t all the time that I have in bringing forward all of these really heartbreaking stories to show the worst of what is going on in our community so we can do better because we are better. I love it. I love the story about the screenplay you were asked to write. Can you tell us that story? Because this is a super cool story. <laughs> sure. Uh, this was when, in the 80s? 70, late 70s. Late 70s, yeah. that I was invited by, uh, well, Jim Conkling, who was a producer in Hollywood, um, who had been invited by the Brethren to be the person to head producing a major motion picture about the Prophet Joseph Smith. So the Brethren were thinking about sponsoring a major oh, they were. motion and they, picture and they, they provided about Joseph the money. Smith in the 70s. They provided the money. Um, and it, it was determined to ask six, maybe it was eight, but I, th I think it was either six or eight different writers to produce a screenplay for a small amount of money that they would give. And then uh, whichever of those turned out to be the best, that one would be chosen to, to be actually filmed. And the Brethren wanted it to go through this, this Hollywood office because they didn't really want it to come directly from, from Salt Lake. 
So Jim called me and asked if I would be one of these several to try it. And I was honored, and I thought, oh, boy. Joseph Smith and I had not had a really, really um, smooth sailing relationship. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I knew that he was an extraordinarily, tremendously, dramatically interesting figure. And, and, and this, this whole thing interested me a lot. And I had spent some years writing uh, religious scripts and educational scripts for BYU Motion Picture Studio. So anyway, I decided, yes, I, I, I would do that. And so I, I dove in, and for a couple of years, I, I immersed myself in the materials that Jim sent to us, books and papers and out-of-print things. And, and it was fascinating to, to, to really read everything that I could about Joseph. And, and I wrote this screenplay that, that I called... Uh, you the, called the, it Joseph, Brother Joseph, Bro Brother Joseph, the, the American, American prophet. prophet. Yeah, and I really enjoyed writing it, and I, I, I found tremendous appreciation and empathy for Joseph, and and I found a lot of anger against him as well. And and I right off the bat, I I said to Jim, Are we, we're going to bring polygamy into it? Well, we have to, somewhat, but that, well, that won't be the focus. So um, I did bring it in, and, and I think I had a couple of scenes that were really very poignant and, and, and very correct in, in how it handled all that. But to shorten all this, um, there were really only, uh, I understand, about three or four of the writers that, that made it through to, to finishing a screenplay. And at, at any this rate... Says your, yours is one of two that made it to the end. Yeah, of, of those that were finished, mine was one of two that was selected as, as, as good possibilities. And they actually thought about trying to combine these two screenplays. And uh. I mean, that's a weird thought. But anyway, uh, finally, that project did not happen. And, and the criticism that came from Salt Lake City about mine was that I, I was too sure Go too ahead, sympathetic it. to Joseph's wife Emma. I was, <laughs> and also too sympathetic to Joseph's friends who turned against him at the end. I'm assuming William Law. Yeah, 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 and yeah. And, and that's true. I, I was. I was sympathetic, and I am sympathetic to to those men, and and certainly to Emma. So anyway, that's, that's the story about that particular thing, John. And the project was put on hold. It, it says was. the powers at church headquarters could not agree on how to represent their founding prophet, and so no film was made. Oh, no, that's true. Can, can you sh would you ever be able to share that screenplay? Oh, I own it, but I, I'm, I, I, I wouldn't want to, to okay. put it out. It, it, it's, it really is not a great screenplay. <laughs> It's, who believes that? Raise your hand. No, no it's, it's not, it, it's not Sorry, a great screenplay. Out, who, who I, I, so. I, I did a, a lot of good things uh, with some of the characters and some of the, uh, some of the scenes, uh, but it was a little bit too much like a, like a stage drama, and it, it relied too much on dialogue. But I did some really good things with it. Well, you wrote, you wrote a theme song. I did. Will you read? Do you mind reading oh, some of the lyrics of your theme song? Wow. Is that all right? Sure. I've got a start for you. I think that's it right there. Mm, I love to yeah. have her read. Those yeah. of you who heard the Mormon Stories interview okay, before. Okay, okay. She's great at reading. I, I, I did write this as a theme song, and yeah. I refer to this theme song at the end. And I, I, I had book? this being, yes, I, I had this theme song being sung as Joseph comes out to greet this wagon train of dozens and dozens of wagons that just that poured, and this is, was all historically accurate. These uh, wagons just poured into far west Missouri, and, and I had this, this theme song going as, that, as he would shake hands with people coming through. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, hold out your hands. Let me touch you help you understand that we are brothers and sisters, all family. Your joys are my joys, and your hurts hurt me. 
Way down within us where spirit is flowing, there moves the dream, the vision, the knowing, that from the beginning God's breath was inside us. There is no ending. Not death can divide us. Brothers and sisters, hold out your hands. Love one another till everyone stands as brothers and sisters sharing the sun, learning at last that we are one. And Joseph did try to, you know, create Zion, did try to teach that we are one and we care for each other and help each other. And, and, and much of that happened well in those early days. And a lot of it didn't. So some of the feedback that this book has received from a few people um, probably reflects the temperament of many who have studied Joseph's life in the 21st century. And that's just a feeling of real frustration and anger at Joseph Smith. Um, talking to a close friend of mine just a couple of days ago who just was furious at Joseph Smith. And, and, and while you don't pull punches on Joseph, um, you have a chapter called Brother Joseph where, you know, you are not only critical of him, but you also are very kind to him. Can you talk about that? And sure. how, how someone who knows so much and feels so strongly about the issues that come from Joseph, that you would write this very hard hitting book that made me want to punch brick. Um, <laughs> how you can still have love for Joseph. Well, I have had people say to me, you were, you, were, you were much too kind to Joseph, much too kind to him. And I, I understand that there is a way in which that likely could be true. I already did have all those stories that I had culled when I was commissioned, of course, to show Joseph in the best light possible. So I had found all of those stories. And I wanted to show him as much as was correct toward the beginning for a lot of his strengths. And I really did not want to just go after him to punch him for just doing all this dirty, awful stuff. And, and so as, as I read that screenplay again, and, I, and, and all of those instances are correct. I didn't make up one thing about those. And they, they did show a man who was generous to a fault, who, who came home barefoot having given away another pair of boots, who really did a lot of remarkably uh, kind things. And, and so I, I wanted to show that part of him so that I could feel more balanced when I actually said the words, Joseph made an error. Joseph made a mistake when he brought us polygamy. And also, you know, I was maybe remembering something I've never forgotten from speech 101 at BYU, where I majored in speech and drama. That a major thing to, to, to remember about creating a speech is bring your audience, meet your audience where they are, and to take them where you want them to go. And I wrote this book not just for those who are dissidents. I wrote it not just for people who already kind of hate Brother Joseph. I, read, I wrote this for the people that I really wanted to get on board and walk with me through all of this to get to some of the tough stuff. And so I really felt that if I gave them a glimpse that I was not a hater of Joseph, which I was not and I am not, that I would ask, I would invite them to get on board and, and they would think, oh, maybe, maybe, I, can, maybe I can do that. And, and I've had a number of people write to me and, and, and thank me for, for letting them continue to have their 
but their feelings about Joseph. Oh, I, I tell you that I, I, I know that I did that, and, and I, I don't apologize for doing that, because it was an honest thing that I did. And you also uh, don't pull punches. I'll just, can I read a little bit of? Sure. Do you want to read it, or do you want me to? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Joseph's biographers, those who today are faithful to the church he founded, as well as those who have no reason to be partial to Joseph, paint a picture with strokes that suggest, here we go, a tragic hero who acted sometimes recklessly. He placed quick and unjustified confidence in people who turned out to be traitorous. He was not economically realistic, attempting far more than he or his people could manage, running up debts that plagued him all his life and fleeing from a financial disaster that he himself caused and that nearly destroyed his church. He was overly optimistic, overlooking the practical obstacles in a plan and going ahead anyway, often to fail. He prophesied success for a rash venture, then blamed his followers for their lack of worthiness when it failed. He could be obstinate when contradicted. He believed all his revelations, never questioning, never doubting that they came from God and making proclamations, in the words of Mormon scholar Eugene England, in the full flush of classic hubris. Mormon historian B.H. Roberts put it this way, the prophet lived his life in crescendo. That sounds like the kind of character that Furies will surely take down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I believe that. He was a very, very, very complicated man. And, and I think he was a tragic hero. But the writing is just so powerful. Oh it's gosh, so John, good. Thanks. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> No question that Joseph used his people, asking of them more and more. He used his people as building blocks, but the edifice they were creating was for each of them, was just uh, as much as it was for him. So, um, okay, so that, that was super useful to understand. Um, you love Joseph, but you also are willing to be critical of him. Oh yeah. Chapter three is a really interesting chapter. It's called The Why of Mormon Polygamy. And you talk about why it happened. So what is your best, after studying this really in depth, if it wasn't revelation from God, how and why did it happen? If you had to sort of like give us a timeline. You wrote a little bit about maybe Fanny Alger and what Joseph was feeling and thinking. By the way, what does comely mean? You used that word to describe Fanny Alger. I think you were quoting others. Who I was described quoting it. that. It meant attractive. 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 Okay, all right. Pretty. So what's your best summary of how and why polygamy happened? I do quote there saying that I, I, I went to Utah to interview a whole bunch of people. And I interviewed, well, one of them was Professor Marvin Hill. And he said to me, do you want me to tell you how I think polygamy got started? And, I and said, he was a church yes. historian, right? Church historian. No. No. BYU? No, but he was a professor of history at BYU. At BYU, okay. And he, but he, he wrote an important book with Dallin Oaks on the fate of the... Uh, uh, Persecutors and yeah, Joseph. Yeah. So he said, my, my best guess on how polygamy came to be is that two things happened at the same time. Joseph was studying the Old Testament deeply, learning about prophets, Joseph knew that he was now a prophet, and he was trying to decide, what does that mean? What does a prophet do? What, what is a prophet? And Brother Hill said, at the same time, I believe Joseph fell for Fanny Alger. And he had all these feelings for her that he felt had to be wrong. But somehow or other, these two things that he had, was experiencing came together. And they relieved him of this terrible, terrible dilemma. And he began to think, okay, if I am a prophet, and there were prophets in the Old Testament, and many of them had more than one wife, and if I am having these feelings for a woman other than Emma, these feelings must be coming of God, and this must mean that I, as a prophet, should participate in the same thing that many of the other prophets did. And so, said Professor Hill, I believe that, that Joseph sort of created his answer by, by bringing those two things together and, and making it work. 
Do you think he believed it? Oh, I think he believed it. I, I do believe that Joseph thought that he was doing the will of God. Now, maybe there was a time when that got so far away from him that he, I, I hope that he wondered, is this really what God wants me to do? But I, I think that rather than just, just beginning and ending with the idea that he was a scoundrel, which I cannot do, I believe that he did believe a very great deal of what this was all about. One of, the, one of the coolest things about this chapter is you sort of take down each of the historical justifications that people have used to justify polygamy. And I'm going to just read some, and if you want to give like a one-second response. Yeah, that'll take you a long time. Well, let's do a couple. <laughs> so, necessary to multiply or replenish the earth. Didn't do it at all. No, no. Did, uh, in, in, well, Joseph doesn't have any progeny that can be proven from these other wives. And uh, in, in Utah, it's been shown statistically that uh, monogamous women provided slightly more children than each polygamous woman did. Okay. T too many women, so many women in Utah, we just had to find them. You know, we all, just had to marry multiple all, women. All the widows. The, 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 the church acknowledges that the demographic show that there was really never a time in all those decades that there were more women than men. Uh, polygamy produced more faithful members, raising up a righteous seed, as they say. Uh, you can, the way you define faithful, you, you can. You, you could say the, those, uh, the polygamy brought people who also were very hard line, authority oriented polygamous people. But, you know, when I, I, I sent an email to Tom Kimball asking his opinion on that, he said, ah, from what I see in my family, and he was a what, great, great grandson of Heber C., he said, um, the polygamy just brought more, what was the word he used? Um, uh, Tom said, um, polygamy brought more fundamentalist people. Yeah. Even now, the majority of my Kimmel cousins are not Mormon, Tom says. Yeah. Yeah. How about there had to be a restoration of all things? Oh, he said fundamentalists and atheists is what he wrote. Yeah. 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 Restoration of all things. Oh, golly. That's just so, that's so. Let's restore everything in the Old Testament, right? Everything. Yeah, let's we get, want all let's that. get animal sacrifice back. Let's get you can't, you know, I, I'm wearing two different kinds of clothing put together that, you know, this is, this is linen and this is whatever, this is maybe silk. Let, let's, let's, let's bring back that you can stone your children if they disobey you. Let's bring back all these things. How ridiculous. I mean, you know, if, if you build, if you build a new house and you say, oh, let's choose something to take from the old house that will really you know, remind us of our good times there. You'll <coughs> choose something beautiful. You, you, won't, you won't find the, the ugliest, dirtiest thing that you could, practice, could bring and say, boy, we gotta restore. I mean, I, I have no patience with that term. No, no patience at all. That, that, that every, go everything had to be restored. I got it going a little bit. <laughs> All right, so maybe there weren't more women, there were more righteous women. The men were scoundrels. So we needed, you know, the righteous women needed to be married to someone. Wait, how did, that's not really in there. What's there are more the, righteous the, women, <laughs> there the are more, more righteous, righteous women well, than okay. men. Yeah, okay, well. <laughs> see, I, I, I have no patience with that either. That's just You a, wrote, this is pretty insulting to men. That was terribly insulting to men. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Carolyn. Come on. I appreciate that. that. That's just so ridiculous. And there's all sorts of other crazy and, stuff. And, and the, the, the only documentation anybody can find for that was some silly dream by somebody, some general authority's son who had a dream saying, you know, when Lucifer, when the, when Lucifer sent out, you know, the, the call that they, the, you follow me, that there were what? A lot more men that followed, no women followed, so there were a lot of women who righteously stayed with Christ, and we have to find a place for them. Come on, I'll give you a lot of my dreams that, that, that bring out all kinds of weird things. Uh, I just give that no credence at all. 
And, and this chapter is wonderful because it gives a takedown of every single major justification ever offered towards polygamy, and it's really good. Well, we, listen, get, go to the one that says, if polygamy hadn't been, I wouldn't even exist. <laughs> That's my favorite awful one. What's wrong with that, Carolyn? <laughs> I tell in the book of, of, of um, my great-grandmother on my mother's side who said no to polygamy. We'll get to that story. There was the great-grandmother on my father's side who said yes to polygamy. I came through the second wife. You're telling me I wouldn't exist unless polygamy had existed? That my eternal soul would not have found some clever way to get itself down to this earth in some perfect spot in order to continue my, my eternal life. Listen, every war that has ever existed brought forth beautiful children. Rape has brought forth beautiful children. Does that mean that these things are good just because they brought forth a child? Come on. There's no logic to any of that stuff. Yeah, turn the page, get a new child. <laughs> Just read us that last, uh, I love, imagine, join with me in, in invoking visual imagery of, of uh, this final few sentences of this chapter. Sure, the, uh, right, well I have to read the paragraph ahead of it. A brother Joseph said that friendship is a grand fundamental principle of Mormonism. True friendship I believe is described in that lovely thought I have read more than once from writer Dinah Crake who lived in England during Joseph Smith's lifetime. Oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but pouring them all right out just as they are, chaff and grain together, certain that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keep what is worth keeping, and then with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. <laughs> I count myself as a friend to Brother Joseph, and I wish to honor him like this. I hold the fullness of his life in the palm of my hand, chaff and grain together. I keep the many kernels worth keeping, and with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. And And that's, that's why I have spent so many months, a couple of years, <coughs> more years, trying to get rid of the chaff of polygamy so we can truly see the more honorable aspects of Brother Joseph's work. Our good friends at Community of Christ have done that, you know. They give us a good example in a lot of ways. Um, one of the first moments of this book that made me want to literally punch my fist through a brick wall was when you, you talked about Emma. Specifically, and I should know this, but I had totally forgotten. I'll just read. Her eternal salvation was at stake. She gave in, took women by the hand, and gave them to Joseph. Joseph. She watched as the two Partridge sisters were married to her husband, not knowing it was a charade to appease her, not knowing that they had been married to him months before. Yep. Can you talk about Emma and Pretty what? dishonest. Well, just talk about Emma <clears throat> and why you wanted to dedicate a chapter to Emma. Well, golly. As I <clears throat> dedicate there at the first page of the book, this book is dedicated to Emma, who was the first to weep. Emma was so brave and, and, and so truly committed to Joseph's work. That's what must have driven her crazy. She was not pretending. She believed in Joseph's work, I think all the way through. So she had to find a way to hold in one hand her belief in Joseph's divine calling. And the tremendous personal hurt 
that came to her through polygamy. She was this bright woman. She was a couple of years older than, than Joseph. She was much more educated. Uh, but she, she revered him as her prophet and her husband. But this thing, this, this dishonest event that came into her life that drove a wedge between her and her husband, seemingly because of God, which thing she didn't really know about for quite some time. She evidently... She was wife saw, number 20-something, right? I don't remember what it was. She, she saw what Anyone was know? happening. What with, number was Emma sealed to Joseph? Well... 23, something like Yeah, that. she wasn't sealed for, for a long time. She knew something about what was going on with, with Fanny Alger. And, <clears throat> but she was kept in the dark for a lot of these women. And, and so this, this woman that I think all of us who know anything about her revere a lot was treated very, very badly. She was treated dishonorably and dishonestly by her husband. And she had to find a way to, to deal with that because here she was, this prominent woman in the community. Her, her commitment to Joseph was profound. And, and I believe she was torn almost to madness sometimes. And I wonder sometimes if she wasn't afraid for her life because there were people who, who wanted to get rid of her, really. When, when she was being a stumbling block to the church, I think she was sometimes afraid for her life. Talk about uh, the healing experience you had and almost the visionary experience you had uh, visiting Nauvoo in the context of thinking about Emma and, and Joseph and the revelation and polygamy. Hmm. It's one of my favorite parts of the book. Right. Well, <clears throat> I was asked to go to Nauvoo with affirmation. You know who they are. Our, uh, the, the, the community of our LGBTQ brothers and sisters in the church and out of the church who have Mormon base. Uh, and I, I didn't want to go. <clears throat> I was so busy writing this book. I, I was saying no to all my friends going to a movie. I was doing nothing because nothing was as interesting to me. Go to a movie, why should I do that? When I could write this book that was so thrilling to me, I would get up in the morning and I could not wait to, and anyway, it was thrilling to write this book. Uh, so I said no to go, but finally my dear friend Randall Thacker convinced me, oh please, please come to Nauvoo. It was a leadership conference and so I, I went and it was a wonderful experience. And, and my assignment was to, uh, to give a talk about Emma in the, what I understood to be called the big room in Joseph Smith's red brick store upstairs and and as, as part of that I I gave the presentation of Emma Smith who is one of the 16 women that I present in Mother Woe of the Morning who have a connection to God the Mother either wanting her having forgotten her whatever it was and of course we know that Joseph did have a concept that there must be a mother in heaven and so I utilized that as my way to write that, that scene of, of Emma. So I, so I did that, and then I went downstairs, and Lachlan Mackay, this very delightful, charming man, who is now one of the 12 apostles in Community of Christ, was there uh, as the shopkeeper. And this is the store where Joseph, um, it, it was really built so Joseph could earn a living, but two or three months into it, it collapsed because Joseph gave away all the goods. He couldn't, the people who could not pay for, for, uh, for goods, he couldn't not give them to him. So anyway, that's where we are. We're in Joseph Smith's brick store. And I am the last one um, to, to finish as people are talking to me. And I, I'm, Lachlan had shown us around and he knew of my interest in polygamy. So he's there, um, as the shopkeeper, and I choose a few things that I'm taking home 
A mug, right? A Joseph Smith a mug. mug. A, a Joseph Smith mug <laughs> that my pens and things are in on my desk. It says Joseph Smith's Red Brick Store. And um, so as, as Laughlin is wrapping these things for me for travel, he says, you know, that the room up there, one of those two offices, that's, that's the place where Joseph Smith wrote out your section of 132 about polygamy. And I said, wow, really? Just right up there, that's where that happened? And he said, yes, it did. And I said, I, I said please, I, I, I've got to go back up for a minute. Can I please? He said, certainly, take your time. So I ran up the stairs. Well, I've got to read it then. Uh, you've got to read it. It's, it's all ready. Tell us what you're reading, though. Oh, you're going to read? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know your book. These are the Joan of Arc boots, right? No. I want to see you wear not. your Joan of Arc boots. I, I, I do. Do you ever wear them in public? No, no. I kept my Joan of Arc boots when I, I, I played Joan of Arc at BYU. Director Harold Hansen. We were supposed to turn all the costumes in, but I kept the boots, and, <laughs> and and they were just felt boots and long shoe laces. And I thought, if I asked here, Dr. Hansen would give them to me, but I didn't ask. I just took them. So they're in my personal archives, and I write tell them, that, tell them, tell them when once, you when you when you wear them. Well, busy. once in a while, I have taken them out and and worn them when I needed to feel Jones. Courage coursing through my veins. I, I have Joan of Arc's boots to wear. Can you guys see cute little Carolyn Pearson putting on her Joan of Arc boots <laughs> to get a little courage for the day? I love that. I want to see a picture of you in your boots. Okay, good question. I'm sorry. I'm we, sorry. Can, we can arrange that, John. Okay, okay. No, these boots I bought in Carmel, California. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, I digress. I digress. And let's get back <clears throat> into the mood here because this is very important. Uh, so I am, I am up there in, the, in, in, Joseph's, in Joseph's office, and I, I, I call down, I'm going inside, but I won't touch anything. And it is, this is an office right by the big room where I just presented Emma. And I, I stand there in the office, and I, I am seeing in my mind's eye three men in that office. Joseph, his brother Hiram, his secretary William Clayton discussing plural marriage and Emma's refusal to accept it. I listened as Hiram urged Joseph to write the revelation down and let him take it over to Emma and read it to her, certain he could convince her it was of God. Joseph replied, you do not know Emma as well as I do. Hiram persisted, and so Joseph spoke the revelation, which William wrote down sentence by sentence. I walked with Hiram as he hurried to his sister-in-law, sat at her home, and read aloud the revelation that spoke of the eternal nature of the marriage covenant and the acceptability, sometimes the commandment of plural marriage. I watched Emma's face, only skeptical at first, become hard, her eyes narrow, her mouth pursed as she heard the words directed to her. But if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord. I watched Emma rise, now with fire in her eyes, as she angrily ordered Hiram to leave, saying that those words were not from heaven, but to come straight from hell. Hiram left. Emma collapsed in sobs, and I watched, seeing it all as I stood there in Joseph's office in the red brick store. I remembered then the big room, just feet from where I now stood. I watched as Emma and her Mormon sisters in that room, in their homes, in their wagons, in sickness and trial, in childbirth, welcomed and used the spiritual power Joseph had promised them. They administered to one another through the anointing of oil and the laying on of hands. They rebuked illness and darkness. They pronounced healing blessings and did so in the name of the Lord. A strong intent moved through my body and settled in my chest. I raised my palms in front of me and I spoke aloud softly. Dear God, our father and mother who are in heaven and in our hearts and in this room, I am so grateful to be standing here. 
I am grateful for the beautiful and important things that happened in this city and in this building. And now, as a member of the church that Joseph founded, as a Mormon woman who has been blessed by many things that happened here, but has been deeply wounded in consequence of something that transpired in this room, I take it upon myself to pronounce a healing blessing. I bless the hurt that has developed from some of the words that were written in this room. Words in what is known as section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Words that through many generations have harmed the hearts and lives of countless Mormon women and men. That this hurt will have an end. That the damage done by the concept of eternal polygamy will cease that the wrong will be righted, and that soon there will be a time of new light, of healing, and of peace. Through the power of my love and my faith, I pronounce that this blessing will be fulfilled, and I do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Huh? Don't you love the, the image of Carolyn Pearson running around pronouncing blessings to heal all the messed up Mormon stuff that we've been suffering <laughs> from for centuries? Isn't that a beautiful image? She's, well, she's doing it. Should not we all be doing that, John? <laughs> Everybody here like has the power it. of healing. I like it when you do it. Okay, John, I'll keep doing it. So another story that made me want to put my fist through a brick wall was, was about Zina. And not just Zina, but Henry. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. Can you just tell us a little bit about Zina and Henry? Yeah, well, see, uh, Zina seems to have been a very smart, personable, attractive young woman. And Joseph recognized that, and he recognized that Zina would be a good addition to the building of his godly kingdom. And so he approached Zina as he had approached and would further approach a number of women to tell them that God was commanding him to take another wife, and she was the woman. And Zina told him that she was engaged to marry Henry, and that's what she wanted to do. And so she moved forward with that. And actually, Joseph was supposed to, um, to, present, uh, to uh, conduct the marriage ceremony, but he did not show up. And instead, what's his name, who was uh, mayor of Nauvoo? Uh, not, uh, pro, uh, not John Bennett. I, I believe it was John Bennett who... who um, Gross. Uh, uh, conducted the sealing. And, no, I'm sorry, not, not sealing. They were not doing sealings right, then, no. but who conducted the marriage. And, but, but Joseph, when asked why he had not shown up to perform the marriage, he said, I cannot give away that which is mine. And he continued to court Zina after she was married and um, to tell her that she was to be one of his wives and she she held to her marriage with Henry and some of this is kind of confusing as to when and how and who was there and whatever but nevertheless she did agree to be sealed to Joseph for eternity while maintaining her marriage with Henry and the the story uh, uh, the official story is that, that Henry was there and gave his permission. There is some family history that, that contests that. At any rate, my, my dear friend uh, told me that his family has always, had always considered that Henry was a bounder because he left, he left Zina and so Joseph and then later Brigham had to take her over. And then when they learned that at the time that Zina was sealed to Joseph, that Henry was on a mission that Joseph had sent him on. 
And again, when, she, when Joseph died and the, the widows were apportioned out and she was given, and I'm, they, some of them had their choice, I do believe, but she was given to, to Brigham. Uh, at that time... Just those words, given to Brigham. Uh, right, yeah, well... Like at, at the time that she began to live with Brigham as his wife, Henry had been sent on another mission by Brigham. So anyway, that's the story of of Henry B. and Zina Jacobs. And you wrote that Brigham even excommunicated him for a he time. He did. Is that right? He did, yeah. Because that's true. why? Well, because evidently, from what can the family can figure out, because, because Henry was trying to get Zina back. So that's one of our really bad stories. You're making me angry, Carolyn Pearson. I'm sorry. That's what happened, John. Hmm. We got to toughen up if we're Mormons. And so this chapter's, <laughs> so this chapter's called "Is There No Help for the Widow?" What, 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 what's your basic point, focusing on widows? Well, I'm, I'm showing us first of all, so that we can understand the dilemma of widows today. We have to understand how this thing happened. So at the time, and seemingly before Joseph died, he made arrangements to tell the 12 that if he died, his wives were to be given to them for, the, for their earth life, but they were still sealed to him. And any children that they had, and that they were to have children with his sealed widows, now their wives for this earth. And they, uh, they all understood that when they met Joseph in heaven, they were to deliver to him that wife and all the children that they had raised up for him. And that set the scene for what happens today. With, with the FLDS church? With well, no, Mormon. with our widows. Oh, right, 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 right. With, with LDS widows who were one of the groups. And we, sometime we need to be talking about the various groups. Of, of, of LDS people who are especially hurt by the, the teachings and the policies that we still have today around the idea of eternal polygamy. We'll get to that. Yeah. The next uh, part that made me want to put my fist through a brick wall uh, was the part about Phoebe Woodruff. I, was about, I almost exploded when I read this. Do you want me to read it or you? Go ahead. Phoebe Woodruff is the first wife of Wilford Woodruff. Wilford Woodruff is known for what reason? Related to polygamy. I didn't, he do the manifesto? He did the manifesto, right? So this is the guy ending the polygamy manifesto. It's his first wife. He's president of the church. You're not gonna believe this. In 1882, Phoebe Woodruff, first wife among seven to Wilford Woodruff, fourth president of the church, speaking at a mass meeting of Mormon women, held in defense of polygamy, said, quote, if I am proud of anything in this world, it is that I accepted the principle of plural marriage and remained among the people called Mormons and am numbered with them today. However, a few days later, a longtime friend asked, how is it, Sister Woodruff, that you have changed your views so suddenly about polygamy? I thought you hated and loathed the institution. Phoebe responded, I have not changed. I loathe the unclean thing with all the strength of my nature. But sister, I have suffered all that a woman can endure. I am old and helpless and would rather stand up anywhere and say anything commanded of me than to be turned out of my house in my old age which I should be most assuredly if I refuse to obey counsel. Well, I have a fine quote from Leonard Arrington, my good friend in there, as he talks about the, 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 the difficulty, the pain, the confusion that, that these Mormon women had, and that, that they, they, they pretended one thing and then they, they felt another, and he said, most of the reason that we don't have good biographies of the early brethren is because of, of the whole, all the family mess, that, that it, it was just so terrible. The, the, 
there was, for most of these families, there was simply not good feeling between them. Yeah, he writes, um, nearly every important Mormon entered into plural marriage, and in nearly every instance, the first wife, though formally giving her approval for the second marriage, privately opposed the second marriage, and privately was jealous of the second wife. Now, this is Leonard Arrington, church historian, faithful, believing person who knew more about church history than, you know, most people on the planet. While she attempted to sublimate her feelings, these were recognized by her children, and these were magnified by them so that it was impossible for them to look upon the second wife and second family in an objective way. Um, feelings developed between first, second, and subsequent families privately, not publicly. They made snide remarks about their, quote, aunts. Wives would tear pages out of husbands' diaries that referred to the other wives and family. They would destroy letters to or from the other wives and families. Bitter complaints would be made, which were passed on to j children and great-grandchildren. And sometimes apologists, polygamy apologists, will say, oh, but there's all these women who spoke so glowingly of the institution. And there may have been some. Let's just acknowledge that. Your response, though, to that sort of broad, broad stroke would be what? Well, human beings, and especially Mormon human beings, try very hard to make the best even of a bad deal, to put our best face forward. And I believe there were a lot of, of polygamous wives who, to some extent or another, were successful in creating a life, perhaps, of cheerfulness and doing the best that they could. But everything of goodness that came from this, I think, was in spite of polygamy and none of it because of polygamy. I have looked for God's fingerprints everywhere on polygamy, past, present, and I do not find one fingerprint of God anywhere. <laughs> well, one of the dramatic climaxes for me in this book was the story of, um, of your great-grandparents, Mary and, uh, and Mary's husband. James. James. I don't want to spoil the dramatic climax, but what do you want to tell us about Mary and James? Oh, golly. I, I, well, I'll, I'll tell you the whole story. Go for I it. Mean, do, for, for people who haven't read it, do you want to save them the, the, to get to the Okay, I promise part? you'll buy the book even if she tells the story. <laughs> Raise your arm to the diagonal. No. I, okay. I, I knew early on that somehow... <clears throat> my my great grand my great grandparents who came from Nottingham, England, and James was a lace maker, and he was uh, important in developing some of the machinery that that led to to new kinds of of lace making. And they had a nice home there, and he when they were converted to the church, they were very very devoted, and so they made they made plans to come and. They did. The, the family came a year early, and James stayed to make money. And so they, they settled uh, in, in Utah and were called fairly quickly to go up and settle southeastern Idaho, the little town of Paris. And they already had, they knew Charles C. Rich, who had stayed in their home. Uh, they held the mission home. Uh, when they were in, in, in Nottingham. And uh, the thing that I learned mostly about them was that during their marriage at a, a time when James brought home a second wife, that his wife of those many decades who had given him, what, seven children, um, that she left him and she no longer would live with him as husband and wife. And so I knew that strange, intriguing story. And I remember asking. She said no, right? She said she no. She said no. No. And they must have had a conversation about it. Every Mormon couple had a conversation about polygamy. And nevertheless, and I, I never knew wh why, at this late time in their lives, would, would James... I, knowing it was against his, his wife's strong wishes, why would he do that? 
And I, I would ask my Aunt Mamie, and she was quite bitter about the whole thing. But anyway, nobody knew any, anything more than what I have just told you, that that, 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 that happened. And, and it was- And then comes Lindsay Hanson Park. And then comes Lindsay Hanson Park, that troublesome, beautiful, red-headed woman who still drinks Diet Coke. <laughs> but because of me, she's drinking less and less. So here comes Lindsay. And, and I, I, I listened to all of her podcasts because, as you know, she has done this wonderful series that she originally called 100, 100 um, Podcasts of Polygamy. And, that, and it, it's gone into much more than that now. But <clears throat> I remember I was standing in my kitchen listening to, to the podcast. And, uh, and at the time I was writing this book, and I, I, he was interviewing, oh, I, I know his name, but I've forgotten it. He's a very smart historian about some of the, the ways that, that polygamy was happening in, in Utah as Brigham took what Joseph had done and doubled it and doubled it and, and, and really made it this gigantic part, this foundation of Mormonism. And, and I heard Lindsay say, and in, in 1873, Joseph, uh, uh, Brigham go. Young. Here go. Let's start. Um, in 1873, Brigham Young gave a sermon in Paris, Idaho, in which he said that if a man refused to take a second wife, in the eternities he would lose the wife he had. And I remember. I, what did she just say? And I played it again. In Paris, Idaho, 1873. So I rewound and I listened again. Paris, Idaho, 1873. He would lose the wife he had. I was just thunderstruck. And I thought, wow, if that is true, that answers a lot of family questions. So I immediately ran to the phone and I called my siblings and I said, did you know this? And of course they didn't. And, and my, my St. George brother, who loves to get on the internet and ferret out things, Warren, he, um, he quickly found, and you know, all of these sermons are available on the internet. So he just put in Brigham Young and the date in Paris, Idaho, and, and the whole sermon was right there. And, and it's, it's true. This, he, this is what he said, that if a man refuses to take a second wife, he will lose even the one wife that he has when he gets to heaven. And I thought, damn. <laughs> I thought, I bet you that is what, what happened. That all these years, he, he said no to the thing. And then when he heard from the person that he considered to be his prophet, that if he didn't go along with this, he was going to lose this wife that he loved dearly. And so I'll bet you he just said, I've got to do this. I have to do it for the sake of our family. I had been really angry with him before, but, but now I felt so bad for him. And so that's, that's the story. Yeah, and Brigham Young goes on to say things like, Joseph received a revelation on celestial marriage, a great and noble doctrine. Now." Where a man in this church says, I don't want but one wife, I will live my religion with one, he will perhaps be saved in the celestial kingdom, but when he gets there, he will not find himself in possession of any wife at all. <clears throat> um, <sighs> Brigham Young doesn't come out too well in your book, Carolyn Pearson. I am so sorry. What do you want to say about, <laughs> what do you want to say about Brigham Young? You know, at the beginning of that sermon, he says, I have brought to you many a fine doctrine, and I have never taught you anything that is not correct. Or I have never made a mistake, or however he put that there. And, you know, and I, 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 I tried and I found some good things to say about Brigham, because Brigham did, does have a lot of important things that he accomplished. He, he really, he, he brought his people here and he, he made, without his, his energy, his, his commandeer personality, perhaps this, this experiment here might never have, have, have been successful. And I, I went out of my way to say that I admire how he had the Salt Lake Theater built before the Salt Lake Temple. 
was even was finished. And he, he brought in it, uh, uh, of the best actors from across, on both coasts, and he made this thing the, 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 the gem, the theatrical gem of the, of the country, really. So I, I tried to tell some of the really fine things about Brigham Young, but there are a lot of things about Brigham that I, that I cannot, I, I cannot condone or admire. <laughs>